The Gospel According to Luke. In the first video, we explored Luke's portrayal of John the Baptist and Jesus as the fulfillment of the story of Israel and of God's promises told in the Old Testament scriptures. We then watched Jesus launch his mission and bring the good news of God's kingdom to the poor among Israel, people of low social status and also people who are outsiders. And Jesus taught that his kingdom is upside down. It's a reversal of all of our common social values. This section culminated with Luke showing us how Jesus was a new Moses about to bring a new exodus by his death in Jerusalem. And so we come to the large center section of the book where Jesus leads his newly formed Israel on a journey to Jerusalem. This part of the book consists mainly of Jesus' teaching and parables given on the road to the various people he encounters, mainly his growing group of disciples. And in this way, Luke portrays following Jesus as a journey It's something you do where you learn as you go along life's path. So first, Jesus invites his disciples into his mission as he sends a wave of them to go ahead of him, announcing God's kingdom. So being a disciple right from the start, it means participating in Jesus' kingdom mission, making it your own. And as Jesus' disciples come back, he then starts to give various teachings about prayer, about trusting in God's provision. It's actually in these chapters of Luke that Jesus talks more about money, possessions, and generosity than anywhere else in his teachings. If following him is truly like being on the road, it should produce this minimalist mentality, creating a freedom from possessions that allows for radical generosity. Another key theme in these chapters is Jesus' continued mission to the poor. So as he travels, he keeps forming his new Israel, and he encounters all these people who are sick or blind. He meets Samaritans who are ancient enemies of the Jewish people. And famously, Zacchaeus, a Jewish man, but who heads up tax collection for the Romans. All of these social outsiders meet Jesus, and they're transformed by the encounter. And so they join his kingdom community, which Jesus describes as a great banquet party. He is here to seek and save the lost, and so he's celebrating when people discover the mercy of God. But not everybody at the party is happy. Luke includes multiple stories of Jesus at banquets with Israel's leaders, and these all become heated debates where Jesus confronts their pride and hypocrisy. And so these contrasting banquet parties, they're captured most memorably in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. So a father had two sons, and one foolishly ran away and squandered his inheritance. But he comes back eventually repentant, and his father forgives him, and he throws this huge party to celebrate celebrate my son who was lost but now is found. But the older brother, who never left his father, he's angry, and he resents his father's generosity to this undeserving son. In this famous parable, Jesus is explaining his whole kingdom mission to these leaders. His parties represent God's joyous welcome of every kind of person into his family. The only entry requirement is humility and repentance. And so it highlights the tragedy of Israel's leaders who reject Jesus and his upside-down kingdom community. And this resistance to Jesus, it ramps up, and he finally arrives in Jerusalem for Passover. As he nears the city, he's weeping. His disciples are hailing him as the Messianic king, but Israel's leaders are denouncing him. And he knows that their rejection of his kingdom of peace is going to set Israel on a road of resistance and rebellion against the Roman Empire, it will bring the city's downfall. And it's that destruction of Jerusalem that Jesus symbolically enacts. As he storms into the temple and he runs out the animal cellars, he brings the sacrificial system to a halt. And he says that this place of worship has become a den of rebels and will be destroyed. Now, this act, of course, generates a whole series of debates between Jesus and Israel's leaders, all leading up to Jesus' prediction that the Roman armies will one day surround this city. It will desolate it and the temple all within a generation. With that, Jesus retreats with his disciples to celebrate the Passover meal. It's the annual symbolic meal about Israel's liberation from slavery through the death of the lamb. And so Jesus turns the meal's bread and wine into new symbols about this new exodus. His broken body, his shed blood, will bring liberation for Jesus' renewed Israel. 
After the meal, Jesus is arrested and he's examined before the Jewish leaders and then put on trial as one claiming to be king. And Luke emphasizes Jesus' innocence. Pilate, the Roman governor, he claims that Jesus is innocent three times before giving in. Even Herod, the ruler of Galilee, finds nothing to accuse Jesus of. But the leaders finally compel Pilate to have him crucified, and so he is. But even in his painful death, Jesus embodies the love and the mercy of God he taught so much about. He offers God's forgiveness to the soldiers as they crucify him. And then when one of the criminals executed alongside Jesus realizes who he actually is, he says, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus' final words are an offer of hope to a humiliated criminal. Today you will be with me in paradise. And so with this last act of generosity and kindness, Jesus dies. His body's placed in a tomb, and on the first day of the week, some of Jesus' disciples come to the tomb only to find it empty. And there are two angelic figures there telling them that Jesus is alive, that he's risen from the dead, and so they leave with their minds blown. And it's right here that Luke tells one of his most beautiful stories. Two of Jesus' disciples, they're leaving Jerusalem for a town called Emmaus, and they're heartbroken over Jesus' death. And then suddenly, Jesus is there, just walking alongside them, but they don't recognize him. He asks why they're so sad, and they go on to talk about all of their hopes, that Jesus would have been the one to redeem Israel. But now he's dead. It was all for nothing. But then later, as Jesus has a meal with these two, he breaks bread for them, just as he did at the Passover meal, and it's in that moment that they recognize him, then he disappears. Luke is telling this story to make a powerful point about following Jesus. When Jesus' disciples impose their agenda and their view of reality on Jesus, he remains invisible and unknown to them. It's only when we submit ourselves to the upside-down kingdom of Jesus that's epitomized in his broken body on the cross, offered in self-giving love, it's only then that we see and know the real Jesus. The book's concluding scene is yet another meal. As Jesus appears to his disciples and he explains to them from the Old Testament scriptures how this was all a part of God's plan, that the Messiah would become Israel's king by suffering and dying for their sins and conquering their evil with his resurrection life. And so now, as Simeon the prophet promised back in chapter 2, Jesus' kingdom will move outward from Israel, so God's forgiveness can be announced to the nations and everyone invited to follow Jesus. But, Jesus tells his disciples, wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Spirit to empower them for this new mission. And this, of course, keeps you reading right into Luke's second volume, the book of Acts. But for now, that's the gospel according to Luke. Luke 11 now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. 
When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you, and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God, and keep it. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then, your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb, and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done, without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers. For they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, 
so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him, to catch him in something he might say. If you're watching us online, you can trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, right where you're at, right where you're sitting. The Bible, again, if you would just believe that Jesus died on the cross and paid for your sins and that he rose again the third day, God promises you that he will save your soul and adopt you as his child. And if you do that, we ask you to please email us uh, and let us know that you've done that. The email address is info, I-N-F-O, at exaltcc.com. That's I-N-F-O at exaltcc.com. Uh, let us know you've done that. We want to send you a Bible, help you in your next steps with uh, your relationship with the Lord. And if you have questions about this, you're like, I don't know about that. But I got some questions. Just please email us your questions. We'd love to answer those things uh, and, and help you understand the gospel better so that you too can trust in Christ as your Savior.